go ahead. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to uh, September 2022 edition of the Global Diabetes Journal Club. And today we have Jacob Morse with us and he is a PhD student finishing his uh, PhD at the University of Wamia and Missouri in Poland in collaboration also with the Howard T. S. Chan School of Public Health, which is where he's sitting, as I, as I understand. That's correct. Yes. Well, so you will be talking about evidence synthesis in molecular epidemiology, and you sort of, sort of take your starting point, in a way from a systematic review you did of meta metabolites and risk of type two diabetes. Um, yeah. So, and this is also in general what your PhD is about. It's about. Um, yeah, molecular biomarkers and cardiometabolic diseases. Uh, That's yeah. correct. So, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us, Jacob, and look forward to your talk. It's a great pleasure to be here. So, uh, again, welcome. Uh, as Daniel nicely introduced me, I'm Jakub. I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Warmia and Missouri in Austin, Poland, as well as currently a visiting scholar at Harvard University at the Chan School of Public Health. And the topic of my today's talk will be uh, a broader perspective of um, evidence synthesis in molecular epidemiology, taking the example uh, from metabolomics and type 2 uh, diabetes. So uh, first, uh, the disclosure uh, of potential conflicts of interest. Of course, the most important uh, conflict I have is the fact that I'm an uh, author of the paper, which will be this talk's main focus. However, except for this, I have no other competing interests. Uh, maybe because uh, I think that the paper was attached to the notification about today's stuff, but if you want to uh, follow the actual text, which might be useful in further slides, here I put a QR code and a PubMed ID just to quickly uh, download it, uh, if you want, of course, uh, before we proceed with uh, next slides. Uh, however, before we begin the, uh, the actual part about the paper, I would like to acknowledge my great friends who contributed as co-authors to this paper, starting from uh, the left-hand side on the top, uh, two co-advisors of my PhD thesis, Professor Rinkiewicz, uh, head of cardiology at uh, my home university in Poland, uh, Marta Gwaszfer, uh, former or still a recent senior research uh, scientist at Chan School of Public Health Department of Nutrition, uh, moving currently to Copenhagen. Next on the right hand side, Lukas Schwingschak, my, me my mentor uh, in uh, methods for uh, scientific evidence synthesis. In the uh, bottom row, Anna Danielewicz from uh, my department back in Poland, Clemens Wittenbecher currently uh, an assistant professor from University of Gothenburg. And on the right-hand side, uh, a person probably familiar to you, Frank Hu, head of the Department of Nutrition at Chan School of Public Health. A uh, few questions I would like to address today, and those are not fixed parts of the talk, but let's say that uh, respective parts of this talk will partially answer uh, partially meaning gradually answered these questions. So first of all, why evidence synthesis matter for molecular epidemiology? Secondly, what's the actual evidence for associations between metabolites and type 2 diabetes? Uh, the third one, so what are the challenges when it comes to pull the evidence from observational studies? And the last one and probably the most interesting for us is what we expect to see in future. Uh, of course, not, of, not all of you might be familiar with all the terminology we are going to use uh, during this talk, but just to make it very brief, I would like to, let's say, do a wrap up of terminology. So uh, as long as we are speaking about molecular epidemiology, we are speaking about applying uh, deep phenotypic profiling methods from molecular biology into classical epidemiological design. And we are doing so having in mind three main aims, literally saying exploration of disease pathogenesis, uh, trying to individualize uh, risk prediction, as well as, which is the most uh, important part from a clinical perspective, 
to look at new targets for treatment. As long as we speak about molecular epidemiology in context of precision nutrition, we find some common goals uh, between uh, this nutrition perspective and molecular epi. Uh, saying that we want to investigate what is the role of dietary factors, how they contribute to the disease development. Uh, we would like to propose new biomarkers of intake, as we know that our old methods are not perfect. And in the end, we would like to uh, make our dietary approaches or dietary therapy personalized for a patient. And from the perspective of this talk, we will focus on metabolomics. Uh, I remember that there was uh, at least one great talk uh, about metabolomics as a part of Global Diabetes Journal Club, but just to very quickly go through our main uh, nouns we are going to use. So we call met for metabolite for us is a small molecule, which is an intermediate of end product of metabolism. Uh, when we are speaking about metabolome, we mean the total set of all metabolites that we can quantify in a specific biological sample or in a living cell. Uh, then such an investigation of metabolome can be called metabolomics. And from this perspective, it's important to uh, split uh, two different methodological approaches, which is untargeted and targeted metabolomics. First one, focus more on discovery part of or uh, hypothesis generating part and targeted approach uh, which aims at particular metabolites so it's somehow confirmatory uh, to untargeted approach. Uh, two major families of techniques we use for metabolomics mass spectrometry based methods coupled with different chromatographies and nuclear magnetic resonance. And of course, uh, I hope that uh, majority of you uh, is familiar to uh, pyramid of scientific evidence. Sorry, Jacob, you just uh, you Oops, just sorry. muted. Yeah, so good. Too many. We are you back again. Uh, so I'd like to highlight that uh, meta analysis is not a sort of the top of the. Uh, pyramid of evidence, but rather a method we can find on the side of that pyramid, uh, of the pyramid, because it's not generating, it's not primary uh, data generation, it's research synthesis, which can be also stratified depending on our certainty in that. And of course, systematic reviews and meta-analyses are on the top of this research synthesis hierarchy. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, so of course, many of you know systematic review. So systematic review aims to answer a clearly formulated clinical question using transparent methods for identifying uh, the whole available body of evidence and then trying to apply uh, some critical uh, view uh, to this body of evidence to say what is the answer to the given question. And meta-analysis in this sense is not really a separate design, it's rather a statistical tool which can be elegantly fit to a well-done systematic review. So without a good systematic review, there is no good meta-analysis. Uh, and an important term which sometimes is misunderstood or maybe is somehow missed. So, and it will be important from the perspective of our today's topic, heterogeneity, uh, basically meaning variety, which we observe in study design, uh, in methodology, in methods applied, uh, and in the end also in the actual estimates. So we can separately say about clinical, methodological, and statistical uh, heterogeneity. However, in terms of crude numbers, we usually adopt some measures to quantify uh, the relative or absolute amount of heterogeneity. And in this particular talk, we'll focus uh, in the later part on tau square and i square statistic, which might be familiar uh, to you. Just still let me let me look at the at the clock, just not to be over the limit. 
so what was the motivation uh, for the paper we are talking about today? And the motivation for that paper, because it's an updated systematic review, uh, was a paper published back in 2016 in Diabetes Care by Marta Guash Ferra. Uh, and I would say this paper is important for the field looking that, I think that just yesterday, this paper was cited uh, like altogether, looking at uh, the citation number yesterday, more than 550 times. So there is a clear interest uh, of researchers into what is published in terms of metabolomics and type 2 diabetes. And I think that even this number of citations might be higher than any single paper that was uh, included as part of this uh, systematic review. Uh, that uh, review uh, focused on evidence published before August 2015. Uh, the body of evidence they were able to pull was uh, 27 cross-sectional studies and 19 prospective cohort studies, which uh, evaluated the link between metabolomics and type 2 diabetes prevalence in terms of cross-sectional studies or risk in terms of uh, prospective uh, studies. Uh, they uh, found that uh, for, especially for amino acids, which were able to, uh, for, to be pulled in a meta-analysis, especially branch chain amino acids and ar aromatic amino acids uh, were associated with higher risk, while glycine and gluten um, were uh, associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. However, uh, as and those results of meta-analysis are summarized on the right-hand side of the slide, However, what is important to note here is the fact that from 19 prospective studies that were available uh, in this meta-analysis, only eight could be uh, put to this common, uh, uh, common meta-analysis. And the reason for that was the fact that it was hard to find uh, sufficient number of studies to conduct the analysis for many other metabolites. So uh, the conclusion that uh, some groups of lipids and carbohydrates were associated uh, with higher risk of type 2 diabetes was based uh, only on uh, qualitative synthesis of evidence. Uh, and the updated systematic review covered uh, last um, six year uh, period, which was after uh, this primary uh, report. Uh, what we aim was to, uh, first of all, uh, increase the number of metabolites we are able uh, to uh, meta-analyze. And uh, from this perspective, we were focusing on association between one standard deviation increase in baseline metabolite level and how this number corresponds to a uh, change in uh, type 2 diabetes risk in a longitudinal follow-up. Uh, and uh, this idea can be uh, summarized by the eligibility criteria you can see uh, on the bottom of the slide. It's important to uh, point out two things. First of all, we focus only on plasma, serum, and urine uh, metabolomics. And second of all, uh, as we couldn't meta-analyze uh, studies using only multivariable approaches, we did not consider them as part of this uh, systematic review. Uh, what has changed during those six years since the publication of primary report? First of all, uh, the number of available prospective studies uh, almost doubled, or even more than doubled. Uh, comparing the number of, meta, uh, of metabolites we could meta-analyze, this number increased in an unimaginable way because compared with the primary report, uh, in the updated report, we meta-analyzed 412 metabolites. And uh, looking about some proxy for burden of work we have done, uh, while the initial report extracted 50 risk estimates, uh, for the current project, we had to extract more than 4,000 of them. Uh, and what, is, what are the facts about uh, this current body of evidence? And I put current in parentheses because, uh, because 
it might be not that current anymore. Uh, so we pulled all together 61 reports coming from 44 original studies. Uh, those studies covered more than 70,000 participants with more than 11,000 uh, incident type 2 diabetes cases. Majority of those studies were conducted in Europe. Uh, Follow-up of participants was rather comprehensive. Uh, a median follow-up was seven years, so we can say that it was uh, enough uh, length of the follow-up for majority of studies. Uh, almost all studies were of uh, high methodological quality. In terms of uh, methods which were used for the actual synthesis of evidence, uh, majority of studies utilize uh, mass spectrometry-based platforms while nuclear magnetic resonance was in minority. Also, a uh, targeted approach seemed to be uh, more frequently used than non-targeted approaches. And what is important to note here is the fact that uh, majority of the studies utilize blood metabolomics either uh, in plasma or serum, uh, but we were able to find only two cohorts which utilize urine metabolites. Uh, and what are the actual uh, numbers? So, um, so estimates for metabolites were pulled using random effects model. Uh, as I said, we meta-analyzed more than 400 of them, and uh, those four, more than 400 metabolites could be fit to 37 distinct metabolic pathways. So that's uh, rather a comprehensive uh, body of evidence. 123 metabolites were significantly associated with type 2 diabetes after correction for multiple testing. And on the right-hand side, you can see a, a court diagram, which allows to uh, map what proportion of each class of metabolites was found to be associated with increased or decreased risk of type 2 diabetes. And uh, going very quickly through some of the numbers and the actual estimates for uh, particular groups of metabolites, uh, the current review uh, confirm uh, findings of the previous one regarding branch chain amino acids, aromatic amino acids, as well as uh, these two associations for glutamate and glutamine. However, for amino acids, uh, and other organic uh, metabolites, we, oh, sorry, uh, I hope that this, that will uh, turn off why it won't be a, a, that, that uh, huge issue. Uh, and we were able to identify a number of other pathways that uh, can contribute to uh, type 2 diabetes risk, including choline metabolism, uh, glycolysis, glyco, gluconeogenesis, and TCA cycle, uh, metabolism of lysine, methionine, also uh, tryptophan, which might uh, highlight some links uh, between good microbiota and uh, pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. So we uh, already can see that uh, we could gain much more from this updated review compared to what was available uh, six years ago. Uh, we were also able to provide pretty comprehensive overview of lipids. Uh, and just to briefly summarize uh, uh, what was available to, to be found for lipidomics, we found uh, rather consistent uh, increased risk of type 2 diabetes uh, for some of uh, ceramides, uh, diglycerides. Uh, as well as uh, ph uh, phosphatidyloethanolamines, uh, while, for example, for phosphatidylcholines, as well as uh, lisophosphatidylcholines, we rather saw a pattern uh, towards lower risk of type 2 diabetes. Uh, to mention additionally, many of uh, triglycerides consistently uh, rather tended to increase risk of type 2 diabetes. How about heterogeneity? Because that even, that's even mentioned in the abstract that that was one of uh, major 
points of limitations uh, for uh, this particular study. So as we can see on the right hand side, we have two histograms showing the distribution of uh, two measures uh, allowing us to quantify the heterogeneity. So tau squared statistic addressing the actual amount uh, of heterogeneity and I squared statistic, which allows us slightly to address that relatively. Um, and as we can see, especially in terms of I squared statistic, many uh, comparisons were above this uh, rule of thumb of uh, 50% uh, indicating substantial heterogeneity. And we run a number of pre specified uh, subgroup analysis to see if. Uh, we can explain this heterogeneity uh, by some uh, splitting of the, of the body of evidence. And we uh, stratified our subgroup analysis uh, for biospecimen, uh, comparing plasma and serum studies, study location based on continents, fasting status, uh, type of uh, metabolomics platform, uh, additionally, whether a model was adjusted for fasting glucose or glycemia traits, as well as uh, for the length of follow-up. And uh, what is uh, important to note here, uh, except for study location, none of these uh, subgroup analysis showed uh, substantial uh, difference in terms of of uh, direction of associations. And actually none of the, uh, these pre-selected groups explain the actual heterogeneity. So we did, we did not observe uh, no heterogeneity in those subgroups. So even in, if the heterogeneity was slightly reduced, maybe in the second subgroup it was still persistent and rather high. Uh, so take home message uh, from the actual paper uh, regarding the uh, paper findings. Uh, so it's important to note, and that's rather a consistent um, observation that uh, higher uh, levels of branch chain, aromatic uh, amino acid, as well as alanine, glutamate, lysine, or methionine are associated with higher risk of type 2 diabetes. We could find similar uh, observations for mannose, pyruvate, and uh, free hydroxybutyrate, so uh, some metabolites related to energy metabolism. Uh, among lipids, we could also uh, indicate a number of classes and uh, individual lipids that were associated with higher risk of type 2 diabetes. However, it, it's important to note that also uh, some metabolites such as glycine, glutamine, betaine, or indolopropionate uh, linked with tryptophan metabolism, uh, or for example, uh, some phospholipids can be associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. Uh, so the second part, and uh, the, actually the most controversial part of my talk are the challenges. So what are the challenges uh, uh, for uh, this particular paper and for the broader idea of pooling uh, scientific evidence in molecular epidemiology. So those are basically questions I would have raised as the peer reviewer of that paper. Uh, first of all, show me your grades. Uh, especially for clinical uh, systematic reviews or systematic reviews that aim to answer, uh, uh, for example, a therapeutic question, we, uh, we want to see usually what's the certainty of evidence. And certainty of evidence can be, for example, assessed using grade approach. Um, we decided in this particular paper not to evaluate the certainty of evidence. First of all, we consider that this systematic review is a bit exploratory. And one of the ideas of great uh, evaluation is uh, this is a decision whether we treat a particular comparison for which we assess grade as crucial uh, so to, to address what's the importance. And here it's hard to say and uh, which particular metabolite will be more important or less important for type 2 diabetes. Uh, but let's consider a hypothetical example uh, made uh, by me for isoleucine. So if we would like to assess grade and uh, just briefly summarizing the uh, decisions we could make for 
uh, particular domains of great tool. So first of all, by starting uh, with the fact that we are using evidence from prospective uh, observational studies and not from randomized trials, and the fact that we are not using a Robin's tool uh, for assessing risk of bias, we have to downgrade our initial judgment by two levels, meaning that uh, instead of high certainty of evidence, we start with low certainty of evidence. Let's say that according to the risk of bias tool we use, we found no serious indication to downgrade the evidence. Uh, then also for, uh, for indirectness, uh, as long as we are uh, running an analysis which focuses on incident endpoints, uh, we see uh, rather uh, no serious point to address that there is an indirectness. However, we have to uh, downgrade that uh, further because of the uh, heterogeneity we found for uh, isoleucin. It's not shown on this slide, but as you, you could remember from previous slides, the I square statistics uh, for uh, that particular metabolite was 88%. Uh, regarding imprecision, we could assume that uh, the studies we were we were comparing, and that's that's uh, let's say not very solid assumption, but let let pick it for now, uh, that the uh, the studies were rather comparable, so we find no indication for imprecision. Uh, additionally, uh, so at this moment uh, we have a low certainty of evidence or actually still very low certainty of evidence. But we can upgrade the certainty of evidence because of the fact that we are observing a dose response association as we are indicating uh, the result as per one standard deviation increase uh, in the metabolite level, as well as the fact that uh, the effect size is large. I think for uh, isoleucin, the um, uh, the uh, uh, risk ratio for one standard deviation increase was 1.54. So considering that's a linear trend per, per unit increase, that's a large effect. So in the end, we could say that the certainty of evidence for the, uh, for the association between isoleucine level and risk of type 2 diabetes is moderate. However, is this result reliable? Most, uh, and the biggest concern here is the risk of bias addressed adequately? And let me uh, explain that and clarify that in upcoming slides. Uh, another uh, important point is the fact that being a good systematic uh, reviewer doesn't really mean that we are the fastest one. So uh, the number of studies is I would say even quickly increasing. And to run a high quality systematic search, uh, it's a matter of time and resources. Most of, uh, mo uh, in most cases, a uh, number of, of people who will uh, to do this stepwise process. Uh, additionally, a problem uh, of systematic reviews, especially if number of studies is quickly increasing, is the fact that uh, the date uh, for which the body of evidence is up to date uh, can very easily be no longer that current uh, because of the fact that publication it can be delayed both due to peer review or other, uh, other timelines uh, set by uh, the editorial office, for example, for a journal. And uh, I did a small experiment by uh, run, rerunning the very same search strategy we used for PubMed. So uh, this first bar represents the number of hits we were able to find in PubMed uh, on the day uh, on which we run the, uh, uh, the systematic search for this updated uh, version of systematic review. Uh, on the day of publication, we could have found uh, more than uh, 600 additional studies. And just today, uh, this number will be more than 850. So a possible solution uh, just to avoid a sort of uh, bias, which uh, can be caused by the fact that uh, we are not no longer that up to date, 
would be a, a living systematic review that could be constantly updated, not even as uh, an article, but maybe as a sort of newsletter on a website. However, uh, as we saw uh, living systematic reviews, for example, for coronavirus research, uh, this is a huge logistic operation. So uh, I would say that finding a team that will be responsible for living systematic review is even more challenging than finding a team for uh, to update even such a complex review. Uh, some, I, uh, some thoughts regarding heterogeneity. Uh, and uh, I like to highlight that heterogeneity does not mean that. It's not, uh, let's say, a synonym in this particular context of diversity. As diversity of studies, diversity of body of evidence can be considered as something optimistic. I would say that we cannot really conclude whether heterogeneity uh, is bad or uh, good. Uh, it's good if we can explain the heterogeneity, but having heterogeneity is another result. So we cannot say it's, it's something bad, but we have to uh, take that in consideration of our results. Uh, however, um, the way how high heterogeneity uh, could be problematic for this particular paper uh, could be split to two different scenarios. And the first one, uh, in case of uh, studies, like for example, for branch chain amino acids, where 90 per, 95, 99% of studies we included showed a huge a uh, positive statistical effect with type 2 diabetes risk. Uh, presence of heterogeneity uh, was disturbing a precise estimation of magnitude of the effect, not the presence of the effect. So if we could try to imagine uh, a, theor a theoretical uh, forest plot for this particular situation would be a cloud of uh, of point estimates with confidence interval far from on the right-hand side or left-hand side from null effect, uh, but still, hetero still heterogeneous, but not in a way that will question presence of the effect. And the second scenario is a bit more problematic here as uh, uh, in case of uh, mixed uh, body of studies where some of them show uh, presence of the effect and others show no effect, then addressing the heterogeneity might question whether the effect is still present. And the big limitation for systematic reviews in terms of exploration for sources of heterogeneity is low statistical power uh, because our, our number is not the number of participants, but the number of studies we are putting in subgroups. And usually we are only able to consider a single feature as a stratifying factor for the analysis. And I would say, and that's, uh, that's not an empirical observation, but a sort of intuition from my side, uh, that uh, a major contributor of heterogeneity in this particular project was the fact that uh, risk estimates were adjusted for different covariate adjustment sets. And we mix studies both with poor adjustment for co-founders and very comprehensive. And for example, for I would say that uh, using this example of branch chain amino acids, that could be an issue here. Uh, a very important point from a practical uh, experience uh, while we were extracting data. So can we name all the metabolites that are included in a particular paper? And theoretically, it's, it's easy. So uh, chemical terminology is very fixed. So if we are calling something as water, we are sure that it's water. Uh, however, it's not that clear anymore if we consider that there are synonymical names as well as isomers. Uh, so maybe for a simple example, such as amino acid leucine, we can be sure that as long as we are talking about humans, we mean 
uh, L leucine and not D leucine. Uh, but for example, as it's indicated uh, in the fourth bullet point, if we consider a monoglyceride with palmitic uh, fatty acid residual on it, what do we mean by saying this particular name? Uh, were we able to say where the palmitic acid residual was located, whether it was with the first carbon of glycerol or with the second, or uh, our analytical platform was not uh, sufficiently uh, detailed to say about a position of, of this fatty acid residual. However, this is an important uh, information because we are not sure if we can put the same metabolite together with others, we think that they are similar in the same analysis. And that's why, uh, and still it's not a practice that is uh, everywhere in every study, a very good practice in terms of uh, harmonizing the data across the studies is to use uh, IDs provided by databases for metabolomics. Uh, an issue which is somehow in spirit of names, uh, but it focuses more on how uh, precise can we be with our quantification is the resolution of uh, our analytical platform. And that's a particular uh, problem for lipids uh, because, and that's, that's a very nice uh, overview of how, uh, at, uh, at what particular levels we can name uh, different lipids, uh, depending on what uh, quality of information we have about them. So uh, we can be very, very basic by just saying what type of lipid class we deal with and say, for example, what's the total number of, of uh, carbon atoms and double bonds per specimen or from the very extreme uh, side uh, on the top uh, with lipid maps level uh, detail of the structure, we can basically say everything about a lipid molecule. And that was an issue also for our paper because uh, for majority of uh, lipidomic studies we included, uh, there was at least one class uh, which provided uh, uh, this detailed information about particular lipid class on a lipid species level, meaning that the maximal information we can get is the class, as it is indicated with this example of uh, triglyceride, total number of carbs and total number of double bands. Uh, luckily for ceramides, uh, we were able to use more detailed information with fatty alkyl level. So we were able to say what's the uh, sphingoid base uh, in a ceramide. Uh, however, by pulling, so by uh, generalizing uh, detailed information from some studies to uh, this lipid special level, so to this more general level of information, we could possibly lose some uh, biologically important information. Uh, publication bias, an old friend of all, or old enemy of all uh, systematic reviewers. Uh, usually it is associated with small study effect we can uh, assess with use of funnel plots, with use of some regression tests for those funnel plots. Uh, and uh, as, a as an example of this particular uh, systematic review, uh, we could find some metabolites which showed significance for those regression tests regarding skewness of uh, funnel plot. However, uh, I would say that's a minor issue. And there are two particular uh, publication bias sources which cannot be really empirically quantified by, but can be noted. Uh, especially in uh, studies focusing on metabolomics. And those two sources of publication bias, first of all, is selective non-reporting, uh, which means, for example, uh, if a researcher does not will to uh, report uh, metabolites which were non-significantly associated with the endpoint, even in the supplement, because like it's a sort of narrative, narrative built for a paper and it's a sort of, uh, or it might be a journal limit. 
uh, this might lead to uh, to publication bias because we are missing some potential uh, estimates. And those were, for example, estimates uh, that showed no uh, association. Uh, of course, we can contact first authors of the studies, but they are not always responding. So uh, there is no uh, clear and one, there is no clear a comprehensive solution to that problem. And another source of publication bias, which I personally call here a keyhole bias, is the fact that we are focusing only on biomarkers which were part of metabolomics platform. Uh, so for example, for fatty acids, which were quantified for many years as a sort of, maybe not usual, but a sort of older concept of biomarker in nutritional epidemiology, we have many studies which provide uh, measurements of fatty acids. However, nobody called that metabolomics. So just by focusing on metabolomics, we can uh, not we can potentially miss uh, some est uh, estimates for particular metabolites just by the fact that they were not called as part of metabolomic platform. Uh, an important question is the fact whether uh, we consider that our exposure is stable. Uh, both in terms of uh, short-term variation, such as uh, variation within a single day, short-term variation, so how it changes uh, by days or weeks, and in the end, what's the long-term stability of uh, this information we assess only in baseline. And for majority of studies, that's, that's as such true, uh, that due to mostly costs, uh, they are able to, uh, uh, to use only metabolomic information from baseline. And that's uh, an already an old example of a study published 10 years ago uh, by Thompson et al. showing what's the within the variation in amino acid uh, levels and acylcarnitine levels, uh, depending on uh, fasting status and uh, physical activity. Uh, so uh, we can see that uh, there, there is a substantial change uh, depending on what particular time we are going to measure uh, metabolite levels. Uh, so for example, for a study which focuses only on uh, fasting samples, maybe this variation uh, is not that uh, problematic. However, if a study uses uh, non-fasting samples, here uh, that's a big issue where we have to address uh, who contributed more to those non-fasting samples, those who were by accident fasted, or those who non-fasted and, for example, had uh, some physical activity before going uh, to the study center. And those are, uh, those are issues we can only think about and, uh, and maybe have some, some uh, empirical evidence from small controlled studies where those metabolites are precisely measured. However, a surprising, uh, at least that was surprising for me, uh, hint from a recent study regarding uh, short-term variation uh, between, I think this study was focusing on three time points. Uh, so metabolomic complex metabolomics assessed every two weeks uh, in uh, three groups of patients, both, uh, healthy pre-diabetic and uh, diabetic patients, considering uh, very tight uh, study conditions, both in terms of sample collection, as well as meals. And this study, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a heat map of, uh, of metabolite uh, levels. And you can see that the pattern, uh, as we go day by day and group by group, is pretty repetitive. As well as on the right-hand side, we can see the intra-class correlation coefficient, which can give us a proxy of how stable uh, are uh, the levels of metabolites. And we can see that for a large proportion of this platform, so I would say that for more than two thirds of all available metabolites, the intra-class correlation coefficient was above 0.4. So uh, for, for epidemiology, I would say that's rather a fair uh, stability. 
Another great case uh, of a study which fo uh, focused on the long term, in this case, 10 year changes uh, in uh, metabolite levels, and that was a study of, uh, that was a study led by uh, co-author of this paper, Clemens Wittenbecher, uh, in Nurses Health Study, showed that actually for 10 year changes in metabolites and those uh, examples which could be found as overlapping with results of our systematic review, uh, that, those, that some of these associations are consistent and we can see a sort of temporality that even a change in that particular metabolite level, not only uh, the baseline uh, level, is informative for risk of type 2 diabetes. We couldn't capture intercorrelations between metabolites because there is no good uh, method to pull uh, intercorrelations from uh, original studies, as well as the fact that correlation or covariance matrices are not consistently reported across the studies. In theory, uh, there is uh, a method called metalasso, which was created for genetic meta-analysis and could be used here. Uh, however, uh, I don't want to imagine amount of work needed to, uh, for example, uh, retype the whole uh, correlation matrix between thousand metabolites, for example, from a one study. So unless this information is uh, automatically available, uh, doing it manually is not is not possible on such a scale. Uh, the very last thing I would like to point from a perspective of uh, methodological challenges uh, is confounding. Confounding a major enemy of observational research. Uh, in this particular scenario of studies, we could uh, see, I would say, two main directions in terms of covariate adjustment. The first one, and that, that was uh, a case for data-driven studies. Uh, those studies usually for single marker associations uh, showed estimates unadjusted or adjusted only for baseline uh, co-founders. And then only the uh, associations, for example, for uh, some sort of joint metabolic score were comprehensively adjusted or uh, a papers which had some older approach, I would say more traditional one, which used a stepwise model creation and comprehensive adjustment for the whole list of metabolites. But uh, that this uh, issue because it's variable across the studies and we can barely address that uh, using just information aggregated on a level of a systematic review. A question is whether we should address or think about some uniform way to uh, adjust uh, all metabolites we have in a data set because we have to think about metabolites not as equal exposures, but uh, we could fit each metabolite uh, in a particular even causal diagram. So technically the, uh, the adjustment can uh, be different depending on the group of metabolite. And the very last uh, challenge we see from a perspective of uh, adjustment in terms of uh, this systematic review is whether we should adjust for uh, glycemia traits like uh, fasting plasma glucose or glycated hemoglobin. And researchers are divided here, uh, mainly either adjusting or non-adjusting uh, and of course, from a theoretical perspective, this can lead to, uh, to different considerations regarding causality of those associations. So, uh, and I think that's, that's already a, a question for a debate we, we shall have after this talk. Are pooled analysis of individual uh, studies uh, gold standard and should uh, be used instead of uh, meta-analysis or systematic reviews based only on, on summarized data. Uh, I would say that both approaches have their pros and cons. However, for many of those uh, challenges we talked about uh, in the last slide, I would say that all analysis of individual studies can still better address them. Uh, 
What I would like to see if this uh, review will be redone uh, in the next six years is the fact that, well, I would like for sure to see more studies covering urine metabolomics as well as more studies focused on those deep uh, lipidomic platforms, not to use aggregated uh, or those more general uh, information, but the detailed information we can have about limit, uh, lipids. It will be great to have multiple time point measurements as well as comprehensive and cross-study comparable platforms. I look forward to more Mendelian anomization studies that could uh, say us more about causality. And of course, it will be great to have transparent, open study data sets, which allow us to share the science and really uh, move the, the field forward. Of course, that's a wish from a, from a clinician perspective that it will be great to see uh, some practical applications of metabolomics in sort of individualization of both risk prediction or, or treatment. However, I would say that's a dream. Uh, some notes for, uh, I would address the future researcher, please consider in your next study, those mostly cover issues that I talked in previous slides. And uh, take home message after the whole talk. Systematic reviews in molecular epidemiology can be complex. However, we cannot rely just on point estimates. We have to understand what stands behind those numbers. Uh, for some metabolites, we can say that this method is confirmatory. However, for many, it's still exploratory and it's not the end of the discussion. So uh, a result of this uh, particular paper could be inspiring to, to, to run new studies or new investigations in existing studies. And uh, yeah, that's our uh, message and that's our plan for future. We look forward. Uh, we want to do more studies on metabolomics and type 2 diabetes. Thank you for your attention. I hope that I fit somehow in the planned timeline for this talk, and I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much for this uh, really, really nice talk. And uh, yeah, it, it, I certainly have uh, several, several questions. <laughs>